when you grow up, one day your looks are going to fade and you will not be this beautiful anymore. And your husband is going to cheat on you and leave you. And all you're going to be left with is your education and your brain. So if you don't start working hard now, you will have nothing when you're older. <laughs> We are live here in studio with Violet Benson. You may Hi. know her from Daddy Issues account that I'm sure someone significant in your life shared yeah. one of her memes with you about. Uh, her memes have ended some arguments between me and my fiance. So <laughs> that's how I found out about the account. Uh, first question we got to ask is what made you start a meme account? I was actually an accountant five years ago. I was in public accounting, so that's really tough. And I really wanted to be a partner. That was my goal. I didn't even care for social media. I actually deleted all my social media platforms when my boyfriend and I broke up because he was posting a lot of pictures with a new girl and it was breaking my heart. And I was like, I fucking hate social media. <laughs> <laughs> so I just deleted everything. And I was just tired of looking at his stupid face. So then I just pursued accounting and I would show up in the morning at 6 a.m. and I would leave at like 11 p.m. because they said if you want to become a partner or if you want to impress the boss, you have to show up before he comes into work and leave after he leaves. And that was my goal. And I was just, you know, regular junior accountant. That's what I was doing. Unfortunately, the team that I was on, the partner was sometimes maybe giving me special attention in a way because I was going after it like I would get on projects where I would work with the senior partner uh, with the senior managers and with the partners and anyone that works in public accounting they know that that's kind of impossible usually it's only yeah the highest you can work the highest people you can work with are managers are senior accountants or managers and I yeah. was getting on projects with senior managers and partners but that's because I've always been incredibly like motivated and that's just who I am as a person um, but anyway, it started to upset some of the women on my team and they kind of started to isolate me and make my life a living hell to the point that um, I would like usually part of my morning routine would be to cry in my car before I walk into work. So I would like sit in my car, cry about my day and then walk into work. And I'm not kidding. Like they would not ha hide their hate from me. Like I remember one day after I finished crying, I went into the bathroom and I was I sat in the bathroom and give myself a little pep talk to go into work. And then two women from my team walk in and they're having a conversation about me. So I have to stay in the bathroom and they're just like having a conversation about how like annoying I am or something. Then they get out of the office. Then they got out of the bathroom. I'm kind of upset. I, as I walk out, one of them accidentally bumps into me and spills her coffee all over my shirt and then I have to go back in my car change I go back into work and then one of them is like Violetta you're late <laughs> like <laughs> we're gonna write that in your like notes or whatever so like that was kind of my experience it was it feels funny now but it wasn't funny right. then no and well, I we've talked about this on the show with some of our guests I feel like a lot of women mm -hmm actually tear mm -hmm. other women down in those settings yeah and don't actually help support someone who's growing up in, or in for, a corporate environment yeah i would say for guys we mostly it's like well fuck that guy i'm just gonna compete my ass off and and be right right but, yeah it frustrates me and i feel like i've had these <clears throat> conversations before with other women or and i think maybe with, with uh, my partners because it frustrates me when women try to tear each other down the workplace just to, to make it further when in reality men would just laugh it off like you know mm -hmm. high five each other and they keep working and that's one of the reasons actually the partner and I would work so well sometimes sometimes he would send me back some of my notes and I literally could cry in that moment he was like what the fuck is this are you serious with this shit like how why did I even hire you like that would be some of the notes and it was okay because that's public accounting mm -hmm. it's painful I would look at it and I'd be like Okay, V, finish this project. You can cry later in the bathroom in two hours. I would like schedule it. I kept working through it. We finished the project. I cry about it. Then I go to my partner and I'm like, hey, this kind of, um, I don't, I didn't love this. Can we have a discussion? Like that was how I worked. That was how my brain works with women. In my, in my job, from my experience, it's like you look at them. One of the girls, one of the managers, I look at her the wrong way. That's it. For the next year, she will not give me any projects. I'm done. And she's going to make sure my... Because with public accounting is you have to make a certain amount of hours a month. And then they uh, grade you and they rate you. And you're basically so... If you don't get enough hours every month, eventually you get on probation and then you get fired. So it's like really serious stuff. So... If the managers don't like me, because some of the females don't like me, they're going to fuck up my hours. And they fuck my hours, they're going to fuck up my promotion, 
and they're going to put me on probation. I'm going to get fired. So it's not fun. So anyway, they're making my life kind of miserable. And it got to the point that I started to get really, really depressed. And I started to get to I, I started to realize in my brain that uh, I may never become a partner with how it's going so far because I'm not getting enough work and all this stuff. And no one's hearing me when I'm getting upset. Um, so I was giving up and that's kind of where Instagram came about. It was because somebody sent me some meme before of the fat Jewish. And I looked up his Instagram and I was like, wow, that's so cool how um, he gets to just post funny things. That's so my sense of humor. And it's just his sense of humor. It's nothing to do with his looks because I forgot to mention one of the reasons some of the women in my work were not that kind to me had to also do with the way I looked. So, but it didn't matter how like I would even make sure my skirts were super long, my my clothes were loose, I wore no makeup, and it still would be some gossip about like why some of the men are nicer to me because I'm a, because I happen to be a really tall blonde with double D, triple D's actually, <laughs> good for me, but <laughs> so standing out for the wrong reasons, women were. Yeah, but I, when I was younger, I was actually really awkward looking. So I find and people bullied me for the way I look because I wasn't cute. And then I finally grew into my looks, so and now I'm being judged about the way I look versus my work ethic. I'm from Russia. I was raised in Israel, and then we won the green card lottery, and moved to the U.S. And my father always told my sister and I. He said, "Listen, when you grow up, one day your looks are going to fade, and you will not be this beautiful anymore." And your husband is going to cheat on you and leave you. And all you're going to be left with is your education and your brain. So if you don't start working hard now, you will have nothing when you're older. And I feel like my sister and I stuck with us. She's my sister works. She's an attorney and a house attorney for a really big company. I was in public accounting and just like who we are. Um, you know, it's something right there that we, and we've talked about this, certainly with Warren Farrell as well, uh, the author of The Boy Crisis, which that sort of straight up fatherly advice <laughs> only can come usually can only come from that sort of place where it's like I'm about to say something it's probably going to hurt you that you're you're not going to like it but you need to hear it but you need to hear it and there and as even at that age there, it's it's such a simple truth that it cuts right through where even it's like I don't like what I just heard but I also know that what you just told me was honest. It's reality, and it's and it's those types of things that set in as lessons, and like that we carry with us the rest of our lives. I mean, no, I 100% agree. Although now my father looks back and he always regrets it. And he's like, I wish I was softer. <laughs> I wish because now, because now look at you, you're too independent. <laughs> so he totally regrets it now. But I mean, my father was hands daddy issues. He was very cold, but he was very he was very honest. So meme account. Anyway, w yeah. Watching <laughs> Fat Jewish's I account. I saw the Fat <clears throat> Jewish. I was envious of the fact that he's able to just be himself without anyone judging him. And that's kind of where Daddy Issues came from. I never started Daddy Issues because I was like, oh, it's going to help me be famous. I didn't even know you can make any type of revenue from Instagram. So it was finally, I made, that's why I created an account called Daddy Issues. I put no thought into the name. I was like, I have Daddy Issues. I'm pretty sure every girl in this world has Daddy Issues, especially in LA. If they don't have a Daddy Issues, they have Sugar Daddy Issues. Something like that. So that's why I created right. it. Um, and then I just started to post memes because I feel like growing, because I was already foreign, I felt really like out of place. I didn't fit in. And then again, in accounting, I really wanted to fit in and like I didn't fit in. So I think I was really lost and didn't know who I was. So when I was starting to post these memes for fun, it was just like me not being sure who I am. And then because of my type of work ethic and the, who I am as a person that I'm incredibly obsessive with things and I want to get somewhere it kind of started to be my my escape from reality so every night when I would finish uh, work I would go home and for three hours I was like okay I'm gonna go to all to like two of my competitors let's say fuck Jerry and the fat Jewish I'm gonna go through a hundred of each one each one of theirs, a hundred of their followers, and I'm gonna like like two pictures and comment on one of the pictures. Okay, I want celebrities to follow me. How do I get a celebrity to follow me? Okay, I'm gonna go to a celebrity. I'm gonna figure out who their quote unquote regular friends are. I'm gonna go on that person's Instagram, write some weird comment on their picture, and hopefully, eventually, they're gonna tag their celebrity friend in one of my memes. And like that's what happened with Joe Jonas. After a few months, he was my first celebrity to follow me, because um, I you know <laughs> saw his friend, or I was like, okay, LA. 
a lot of people are kind of followers. I know a lot of these people. I know what they're like. They're all like wannabes, want to be cool, but a lot of them are not secretly, to be honest. No offense to all my friends. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm going to, because it was anonymous. So I was like, I'm going to follow like a group of friends and they're going to end up talking among themselves, like who Daddy Issues is, because Daddy Issues is a persona that I created. Mm -hmm. It was this girl that I really wanted to be. She was really confident and like, aware uh, understanding of her sexuality and she had no problem like saying how things were and i was like she's so cool i literally created a whole persona where i wrote about her and about her life because i didn't think i was her so basically anyway these people in la they would be like wait are you daddy issues are you daddy issues and then they all follow it they'll talk about it i follow that group of people i go back next to the next like cool group of people and like that's how it became like the word of mouth and and then i started to like to look at comments of, uh, of people who were tagging their friends. And they would be like, oh my God, her captions. And I was like, oh, my caption? It's like two words. Oh, okay, let me make it longer. Suddenly it's like a full sentence. Oh, they still like my captions. It's longer. Then I'm seeing like engagement. Okay, these posts are doing better. So that means people want me to talk more about maybe female sexuality. All right, let me delete these. I'm going to post more like that. So in, in a way, people don't get it. They created me. Like Daddy right. Issues was created because of the fans, not because I had this full on idea and elaborate plan. I didn't even know who I was. And I didn't even think I was Daddy Issues. So that's how, how it was becoming popular because every night I focus a lot on it and it was a lot of work behind it. And I was doing it for my own self esteem because like I felt like I was nothing. And like seeing people tag, when I was watching girls tag their friends in my memes, I was like, oh my God, like I'm not alone. Like other people feel this way too. And then eventually I was starting to understand who I was and then to see that it was making other people feel better about themselves. It was really cool. So, what was the first time in hearing your friends talk about this person when <laughs> you were had, snickering inside like they're yeah, talking about me yeah, and don't how did, know it? How did that feel? Well, one thing was funny when people in my um, firm, I suddenly started to hear them talk about daddy issues, including the f girls who didn't like me. And it was just like, they would be like, oh, she's, oh my God, this girl's so funny, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh my God, like, how can you like her but not me? Like, that is me. Are you kidding me? Like, I am her. I knew you could like me, <laughs> you know? Aww. But like, it's crazy. It's like, sometimes you want something so bad yeah. that you're not seeing anything else. And it's so funny how eventually, like when you were able to find yourself or whatever, you realize like who gives a shit. And it got to this one point that was suddenly when I finally started to understand who I was, because literally the fans helped me become daddy issues and I started to become more daddy issues. Suddenly I didn't care anymore for these girls to like me or whatever. And men sometimes can be so stupid. <laughs> No offense, but this goes uh, into relationships too. My partner, the whole time I was complaining to my the partner that was my mentor, and I have issues. He wasn't fully hearing me, and I kept saying, "Eventually, like this, I'm going to have to leave. Like if, like I can't do this after a while." And he was just like, "Just be patient, just be patient." So I feel like he wasn't hearing me and my emotion. Eventually, when I gave up, is when I stopped caring, and that meant I was like probably between some of my last month. My, my last month's there because mm -hmm. I was going to leave. That's when he was like, wow, Violetta, I've noticed you. You stopped complaining, blah, blah, like that. I'm really happy that you finally got through it and everything's going well. Like, I'm so happy we can move forward and you finally don't care anymore. And I was just like, men. <laughs> like, so that literally goes into relationships. People don't understand. When women are constantly arguing with you about something is because they care about the relationship. When they stop arguing is when you should be worried. Oh, and yeah. it was the same thing with my partner. That's that should have been a, a like a red flag for him. If I don't care anymore about this job, if I don't care to argue anymore, that means I don't care about the job. And yeah, that's what happened. I I um, they literally and eventually couldn't fire me because there were so many issues with HR with the women. Because I had some one time this girl, uh, one manager from a different branch, um, like yelled at me. I mean, when I tell you it was bad, like one girl from one, another branch took me in a room when she was like, I heard you went to the partner and you complained. And she goes, Violet, this is like high school. You're a freshman. We're seniors and we're, we're going to bully you. <laughs> wow. You need to fucking take it. OK, you don't go to the principal and you don't complain. And I was like, but that's what I would do at school. What do you mean? She goes, well, you don't do it here. Who do you think you are? And she was like this tiny little girl that I could literally just flick with my finger. And I just had to stand there and listen to her because I was like, how absurd is this? Like how? How insecure are you in yourself and how like how miserable are you that this is what's bringing you joy to like yell at me 
And I was just listening and thankfully an HR person walked by and they heard the yelling and she got suspended for that. Wow. And anyway, because of that and other things, HR that was involved with HR, they literally couldn't fire me. So that's what was so funny. Even if I was on probation with my hours, no one could fire me because I could sue the company. One, like one manager told me that I should get on medication because I was too outgoing in the office. And I believe them because at that point I really wanted to like me and I got on Adderall. That's one of the reasons I'm still on Adderall. I've been on Adderall for five years now because I'm addicted to it. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously starting an anonymous account, you have to make a decision to out yourself. And what went into that decision to step out front of that account and be like, hey, it's me letting your friends, family, coworkers know? Well, I think I've only been quote unquote out the past three years and I've had that account for five years. Um, I think it, it got to the point where I finally felt so, A, I quit my job, so I'm finally full on daddy issues. I incorporated myself that same week because I used to be an accountant. <laughs> um, and then I think slowly, I, when I kept posting, it didn't feel like it was my alter ego. Like it didn't feel like this cool so girl anymore. So it kind of melded. Like, it started to feel like it was me. And then when it started to feel like it was me, I was so happy and like, to finally know who I was. It was like the first time in my whole life that I felt like I had like a purpose and like I knew who I was. So I really wanted to tell everyone. Like it was a no brainer. And I and I thought it was a good idea to put my face to the brand. And I think I'm not gonna lie, like I start to get jealous when people start to say it was them because I was like, no, it's like you don't have my sense of humor. It's me. Right. <laughs> and so taking ownership was a part of it. Exactly. So then I um I what happened was basically the first um, network or article, whatever to ever write about daddy issues that really helped me stand out was MTV. So because of that, I kind of stayed loyal to that and I reached out to MTV and I was like, hey, I'm going to reveal who I am. Can we do, uh, can you write about it? Right. And that's kind of how it happened. And honestly, if this happened now, no one would give a shit because meme accounts are so saturated. But back then, I managed to grow so quickly and I am like a considered an OG account. I'm like an OG meme account, one of the biggest ones, even though I I've only been doing I've been doing this less time than the other quote unquote OG accounts. But people don't get that, don't know so that. So just walk us through obviously the pushback because we were kind of talking about this before the show, you know, you are struggling to build this confidence and as you melded, of course, people are seeing your account, your past posts and now they're judging you off of it. You had this anonymity before you were not that person and now you're walking around and everyone knows, oh, you're the one that posted that meme. Yeah, I feel like annoying thing that suddenly I did, I feel like I did have to make things a little less sexual at one point when I first revealed my face. Like some of the sexual jokes I was making before, I couldn't make it. Or at first, some people, a lot of people were upset that I wasn't, I got a lot of positive feedback when I quote unquote came out, but a lot of other girls were upset that I wasn't their nationality because right, you know, they, they had they... an image of me or I wasn't a lot of people were upset that I wasn't fatter for some reason. That was like a big thing. <laughs> They're upset that I wasn't heavier or uglier. And I understand. I like I literally understand because they I I think one of the main reasons it was so important for me to be anonymous was because I was so sick of everyone constantly focusing on my looks, whether sure. I was too ugly right. or too pretty now. And that's why when I found this meme account, it was just on who I am as a person trying to find myself and that's what people fell in love with and that's kind of the same thing after they saw my face you had no choice but to, now to fall in love with with me like you had no choice but to love me now and my face because you already fall in love with who I am as a person because a lot of times we tend to judge people by the, the cover or whatever so um but yeah it was hard with people judging me with like the sexual stuff but I got over it well for for social media what I've been able to notice is the stronger you're able to capture what other people are feeling, the more they're going to share those images and those tweets and everything. And then for you to be able to do that, to touch them in, in such a place, of course, they're going to want to know more. Who is this person that makes me feel this way? And if you're speaking and empowering other women and lifting them up or letting them know that they're not alone, of course, they're going to want to know more. And it's, it's interesting to me that, um, that you were able to hold it off for as long as you did. And it probably definitely played into your, your favor. Uh, of I think course. so too. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, let's talk about the dating side because obviously it's got to be pretty intimidating for some guys to see all these daddy issue memes <sighs> flying around and, and know that you're the one behind them. Yeah, it's funny. I feel like daddy issues definitely hindered my dating life for sure. Um, that it's, but it's, I think it's always been like that. Like sometimes the more successful you are, the, the harder it is to date, but just like a, it was hard to, I feel like it was hard to date because it's intimidating to guys when I'm sometimes not that I'm making fun of guys, but I'm making fun of sex stuff or stalking or whatever. So sometimes a, you can't tell if I'm, are you as crazy as the memes <laughs> on daddy issues and, or like, well, right. And that's the thing. I mean, for us guys, we were laughing about this earlier. And as I was saying at the start of the show, we sort of encounter it when a female a woman shares it with us like I'm not regularly following it but then it'll get passed to me my fiance's passed me memes her friends are sharing memes so I'm seeing like a small snapshot and typically those are the more like raunchy the more out there the more crazy so you have this whole catalog of your thoughts and feelings fully documented out there in the world. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's That funny. anyone can play the gotcha game with. No, I feel like my biggest issue with dating was at first, when I first came out, was being overly sexually explicit and all that. Like, A, I started to feel unsafe, to sure. be honest, because a lot yeah. of the stuff was so sexual if, if, uh, at one point when I was posting that... I didn't feel safe anymore to post anything that sexual because I didn't want men to think like, oh, she's asking for this then. Exactly. Like, oh, she loves to get drunk and then she loves to like have anal or whatever. It's like, nope, don't, not. Like, I remember one time at a party because because at one point I was dropping hints of who I was before I came out. So like I had these sneakers that it said daddy issues on them and like very tight fans who watched me on Snapchat would be able to tell by like my nail color or like my sneakers. I remember oh, one wow. time... So some people would sometimes figure it out. And it was really oh. cool for them, like usually females. But I remember one time I was at a party that I was anonymously hosting, don't even ask, and someone, a guy, noticed my shoes. I didn't know that he noticed my shoes, but like I, I started to notice there was a guy following me. Like every room, this guy keeps going, and like it starts to get darker, and I'm, I'm alone at this party. And then his friends show up, and then him and his friends are following me now. And it, now it's like really late, and I want to go to my car, but like I'm... So it got to the point they're following me and I turn around and go, why the fuck do you keep following me? And you're just like, oh, oh my God, I'm, 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 I'm so sorry. Just, are, are you daddy issues? And I was like, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, can't you just be normal and just ask me? Like, I thought you guys were going to rape me and gangbang me. Like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm like, do you understand how unsafe you guys made me feel? Like I'm a girl alone at a party and you guys are like six guys following, following me. Yeah. I literally thought I was going to get raped. And he was just They're like just huge fans and they, they were that's just so funny and they were like they couldn't even speak when they saw me and i was just like damn okay like just. <laughs> so they were intimidated yeah so at first it was hard to date because people i think guys sometimes thought i was like as crazy as my meme ac accounts or as sexual all that like i'm not a quote unquote good girl or, or whatever i'm looking for or they want to tell their friends that they hung out with me versus actually they just want the character versus to get to know me then I finally was like, okay, I'm going to rebrand myself. Now I have Viola Benson, which is me as a person, and it's separate. So Viola Benson is more PG-13, and it's more about helping women and empowering them. It's not about, like, being whatever daddy issues is. I thought that would help me. And now men are – and I have a problem with dating because men are intimidated because I'm successful. So I was like, damn, I can't win. Like, what do you want from me? <laughs> so with the, the different accounts and the different personalities, do you find yourself – very fluid between them all or is one more of this is my sense of humor am i out there and violet benson is me as the person or is it all sort of back and forth i mean i think that part is definitely hard because i feel like at one point i started to lose myself in daddy issues i would imagine so and i do remember at one point sometimes i if i was in an argument with some with someone or i say something crude to someone a text because that's how daddy issues would act. Because sometimes she's, and just, it's funny to me. And I would laugh after it. Mm -hmm. And then I started to notice that people were not reacting like it's funny. They were like, what like what the F is your problem? <laughs> right, on a <laughs> meme, that's funny. <laughs> but yeah. In a text, like, not as much. And I had to process in my brain, like, oh, it's not funny to be like sometimes toxic or emotionally abusive. Like, oh, okay. And I had to kind of separate it myself because suddenly I was like, shit, I'm too, I'm too daddy issues. Like, I don't even know who I am. And a lot of people get lost in whatever internet characters they play because it's like it's literally like I'm playing in a movie and eventually like actors happen to them where 
they get lost in their um whatever whoever they're Thir- playing and sure. the fans are expecting a certain yeah. persona from you that you have to live up to no yeah so it got to the point that sometimes when i would meet people my brain automatically would be like okay who do they want me to be so i didn't know how to act i was like, just do you think if you were in a happy healthy relationship right now and you're just posting about how much you were in love that your fans would be upset or would they be happy? no i think i think my fans actually want me to finally get in a relationship like i think because because my fans are growing with me so a lot of them are probably like already in relationships now or soon gonna have kids or whatever like i i'm not gonna like i can't wait to get pregnant I'll just be honest, putting it out there. Not today. Yeah, it's not happening like, on the show. Like, but like next year, like, yeah, definitely that, that's in my thoughts. And I know I will continuously rebrand myself. But um, and then if I'm making jokes, then it'll be jokes about dating. Then it's jokes about being a parent. Like, it's OK so if I'm going to lose some followers. you see the brand evolving. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna do memes for the rest of my life. I don't. Well, I not just not. memes, but that that tone of. Well, like, my brand already involved when I started Viola Benson, like my second my secondary Instagram, which was like the past year, year and a half, and then I started my podcast. My podcast is literally everyone. Some people were disappointed because it wasn't always about sex. It was. It's literally about like how to deal, like how to heal, like steps to get through depression, or like how to get over a boy, like how to heal yourself, like how to love yourself. It's more like things like that. Well, let's talk about that, because we have some listener questions to get okay. through, and we actually got a question here. Now, this is a question from Steve, but he's asking exactly that. Longtime listener and fan, I listen to your show, and I think it's amazing. My question is about confidence, but also dating. After investing so much time and effort into one girl I was pursuing only to be let on and hurt, how can I move on? I haven't been in touch and don't plan on reconnecting, but I want to learn how to move on and become a better me for tomorrow. What would you do or how would you go about it? Well, I can totally relate to this. His name is Steve. Yeah. Well, Steve, I can totally relate to this. I feel like I always lose myself in a person when I'm dating them. And then I always feel so disappointed and let down when I when it's when it's over. And I always and it's completely normal to think, okay, what did I do wrong? And you completely lose yourself. So then you suddenly don't even know who you are. And that's usually when you have to go back to being yourself. So, A, I think you have to accept the fact that it's over and you have to accept the fact that you didn't do anything wrong. You you guys were just not right for each other. And eventually you're going to look back and you're going to realize that this girl probably didn't deserve you, especially he said that he felt like he did everything that he yeah. could. So I think once he stops blaming himself, why it didn't work out and, so, and takes her off a pedestal because he obviously put her up on a pedestal. Yeah he'll realize that like there's so many other people out there and working on himself means that he's not going to be stalking her and that he's going to continue to be like a positive person he's going to attract that energy and he's going to eventually when he feels ready find people that are right for him and they're going to put just as much effort but actually it's funny because yesterday i was giving advice on my um, podcast it was like it was a a dating it's an advice episode solo soul episode and that was one of the answers that was like a similar question and i was saying this one girl said well um the past five guys that i tried to date they all ended up being like i don't know if she said toxic or they all end up ghosting me blah 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 like it's like why is it so hard to date and i go well honestly maybe it's you not in a way that she's doing something wrong but in a way you're attracting the wrong people because now it's becoming a pattern so after Mm -hmm. a while you have to open your eyes and like okay well if every person i'm attracting is toxic or like every person i'm attracting will always leaves me and doesn't love me maybe i'm attracting these people because there's something in me that i'm not seeing so like for example last year i was dating younger guys and i realized it was probably because i didn't feel ready for a relationship so then i was going for younger guys because i I think in the back of my head, I knew it wouldn't be anything serious. So I think once you look inside yourself and you understand who you are and why you're looking for the specific people you're looking for and you work on yourself, then you're going to attract like a healthy person once you're healthy. Healthy people attract healthy people. And I think being reflective is incredibly valuable in this situation, but not exactly that. Giving this one person so much power. It's a pattern when it's five or six people. Oh, yeah. But one person doesn't really say that much about you. Creating some space. We love recommending travel, just going on a trip, getting out of that environment, getting away from the stimulus that makes you think of that person. And you're already on the right path because you're looking to become better. And that's how you're going to find that better person by working on yourself. So I think he's already halfway there. We have one here from. Well, I just want to add to that. The other the other point to that that needs to be discussed is 
the time it takes to get over someone. There's a healing process that you cannot rush. You can't skip over. Uh, you can't drink your way through it. We'd like to think we can, but um, it, it doesn't happen that way. And as as smart as we like to think we are, when it comes to, to our own human behaviors and patterns, they need to run their course and you're not gonna be able to do anything about it. And so it's a healing process and you have to be patient, but one day you're gonna wake up and you're gonna be smiling and- No, I agree. That's so true. I remember with my first boyfriend, I literally thought I was dying because he <laughs> took my virginity and you know, like I love him. Like he was, he's the one, because mm -hmm. I mean, he was inside of, of me. Like this is it. Like we're together forever. And then every night before I went to sleep, I first I kept saying, "I'm going to get over." His name was John. Ugh, I hate that I'm just admit that. But his name was John. I was like, "I'm going to get over John." I'm going. And every night when I went to sleep, I said that. And then I started to say, "I'm over John." And then one day I woke up and I was over John. But like every night, I kept telling that to myself. So I agree with you that healing is important. It's mm -hmm. okay to hold on. What's your sign? I'm Scorpio. I told like, you, there's three of us. Oh, right? oh, <laughs> God. Yeah. Because you were saying traveling. I was like, oh, is he a Sagittarius or something? Well, I, yeah, I don't know if you were uh, texting last week, but I was hitting you up. I was like, oh, no, you're scared about that. being a Scorpio. I'm like, there's going to be three of us in a room next week. So, so now that we've, we've talked about signs, we have a question here. <laughs> My from, dad's a Scorpio. From Amos. He asks, how can I be courageous and face anyone without trembling or sweating? How can I get that strong confidence? And of course, when we talk about nerves and energy and, and part of this, it's due to lack of experience. So the easiest way and often the hardest way to start overcoming this is to get more experience talking to people, whether it's being trembling or sweating with complete strangers on the street at Starbucks or CVS, uh, working through it then is a lot easier than at a job interview or on a first date, etc. cetera. Uh, how have you felt? Obviously you've been bullied. You've been around some people that have been intimidating. How have you handled that building up some courage in yourself? It's actually funny that you ask because I have a method. I had a method for that. Well, a when it comes when the whole thing with like my past of being bullied and all that, I think to have the best point of view in life is to never view yourself as a victim. So like I've been cheated on, I've been a, I've been bullied. It's my third country that I'm living in, but I never view myself as like poor me. That's a. But when it comes to gaining confidence, um, it's something that I I worked on on over the years and I started to do that I started this in high school where I started showing up to parties by myself and it was because I was so I constantly had anxiety just talking to people and it was a thought of like I didn't have a safety net which were my friends so I would start showing up to parties by myself not knowing who's there and then it would force me to either talk to new people until my friends show up or like talking to my friends and talking to other people and it become all to the point that it's a habit now my friend Ricky Thompson just went on my podcast it'll actually be a today but whatever but on the like he literally made a joke because he he's a youtuber and he was like yeah dude what's up with that you're like literally the only creator i know that shows up to events on, on her own like i love that about you but it's like why do you do that and it's it's a habit that continued so even events now i show up by myself but i've given this advice before where one thing that you have to realize is that everyone else is just as insecure as you are so once I, I process that in my brain that everyone else is just as insecure as me everyone else is just as self-absorbed as me so they're not even thinking about me they're thinking about themselves and that take i take away the power from these people and now that i know my brain they're just they're just as uncool as me nothing else matters and that's why i can go to parties and i can just talk to people it happened before this one girl i was really intimidated by her because she started dating this guy that i just stopped dating she didn't know that she was dating a guy that I just dated. I saw her and my heart dropped and I was like, of course, she's so much prettier than me. She's so skinny, like she's so beautiful, like I'm so jealous. And I was like, okay V, like don't become obsessive, like go with the flow. I, t I worked the room, I talked to everyone at the party. I was like the life of the party. I even talked to her and her friend and then the end of the night, her and her friend came up to me and they were like, can we just tell you like, we think you're so cool. Like how do you just talk to people like that? Like how are you just like, you just like talk to everyone. It's so cool how confident you are. And I was just like, that's so funny to hear that coming from you because I was so jealous. Like I didn't tell her obviously. And that's what the podcast but. is about. I mean, this is a skill. What we're talking about mm -hmm. is developing a skill and typically it's due to a lack of experience. So whenever we're doing something for the first time, it's gonna feel strange. Our nerves are gonna get the best of us. We may be trembling or sweating a little bit, but like you going to those parties alone over time, now you know, oh, I can flip on this switch. I can work the room. And what do you know? The person that was intimidating actually comes up to you and says yeah. you're cool. 
Yeah, or like, you know, sometimes have pep talk with, with yourself in the mirror. Like, it's actually weird, but sometimes if I feel down, you just have to, or you write down things you like about yourself. It's incredibly uncomfortable, and it's kind of like, what the F? Like, I'm not going to do that. It's so stupid. It's actually not. And if you look at yourself in the mirror and you tell yourself things you like about yourself, it gets really uncomfortable. But it makes you feel better. Well, and then you're focusing on the right things, right? Yeah. Because our mind is so powerful. And if we are just focusing on the negative or our external feelings or even worse, what other people are thinking, yeah. then we give away all of our power. And I've, I've approached people before that were just not friendly at all. And I was like, all right, never mind. And of course, it makes me a little uncomfortable. But like, I keep going because... Who gives a shit? I'm going to forget about them tomorrow. Like, why would I create such a big scenario in my brain about these people? I don't care about them. And yeah, just, I mean, it does take skill and you do have to feel good about, about yourself inside. Mm -hmm. I've had days that I didn't feel good about myself when I go to a party. I don't want to talk to anyone because I feel small. Well, all yeah, the, that's okay. Yeah. All the bad times tend to stick out because it hurts us and it puts us in a place where we don't want that to happen again. Yeah. And so those just stick out when the data shows that obviously more of our interactions go really well, but we just don't see them the way we remember the, the bad ones that go. Now, this one I'm, I'm interested to get your take on because I feel like with your profile and the fact that people were stalking you over your shoes and trying to figure out how you are and now want you in their lives as their bestie and, and chase after your attention. <laughs> This uh, is a question from Simone. She asks, I often get the advice that I should get to know more people. But what does that mean exactly? And how can you tell if you truly know a person? How much and what kind of information do you need to know about them before you could say that you know someone? Now, I'm interested in your take because I do feel like, obviously, with the popularity of your Instagram and, and people feeling like you know them and you've been sharing your deepest secrets with the public, they come up to you and they're like, oh, we're just naturally besties. You, you speak my language. You read my mind. How trusting are you with people in your life and how do you know when you can trust someone as a friend and that you know them and you can count on them? I mean, I guess you never really know, <laughs> to be honest, but you start to have a, I mean, in this industry, you start to have a radar after a while. So you kind of can tell who wants to use you and who doesn't. And a lot of times I feel like it does make me then. But I, I mean, she's not talking about this type of industry because for me, like I end up isolating myself a lot of the time and end up making friends with people who do what I do because we understand each other better. How'd you, how'd you build that radar to know that people are in it for the right reasons, want to get to know you versus... I mean, obviously, getting my heart broken a million times by dating people and by friendships, but eventually you just start to notice whether it's like you hang out with someone for the second or third time and suddenly they're like, how come daddy issues doesn't follow me? Or like... Um, Oh, oh my God, like I just, I, let me run this cool business idea by you really quick. Like you think you can, you can think you can shout it out one of these days or, well, it's like things like that. And you're like, oh, okay. So it's, I feel, I would say it's really obvious. And after a while it's, I think my radar is, gets bigger to the point that now I'm like, oh, you're a struggling artist. I'll see you later. Like I already know in my brain what's about to happen or like, oh, you just started a meme account. Okay, cool. I'll see you later. Right. Like I'm not stupid. Right. I but I'm really I like people in New York are really straightforward. Like that's why I love New Yorkers. And I have I've met people before that were like, "Hey, I would love if you did this for me, but here's what I can do for you." And I'd be like, "Okay, like let's talk." Cuz then it's like, "Okay, you're being upfront." Well, straight up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I feel in general when you're living your life online, it's so easy for people to feel like they know you on a much deeper level than let's be honest. You're not following their account. You don't know them. So I'm sure there are people who are like, oh, I, I know daddy issues. I've been following you for four years. Like, I, I like all of your posts. And I say, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not like, do you want to come over? Do you need, do you want my address? Do you want to come over? But I've always been, it always takes me a while to become friends with people in general. So it's nothing to do whether or not they have followers or not. Right. I, a lot of times if you ask some of my friends, I can come off not standoffish, but um, indifferent. It takes me a while. Like, I feel like I have to be around someone like a few times nowadays. I've, maybe I'm jaded, but it literally takes me like a few times to be around someone to suddenly get friendly and be like, OK, like, let's hang out unless right. we click. Some people you just click with and you're like, I Absolutely. love you. And you just become friends right away. Right. The and in those moments, it's sli so the question I feel that she's asking here is 
how do you know when to trust that this person actually cares about you for the right reasons? And it seems like you've built up a bit of a radar for that. Obviously, the transactional stuff and, and the account. It's intuition. I mean, you can just feel it. You Like, if there's a weird feeling, you think something's off, like, you're most likely right 100% of the time. And it's, it has to do with your intuition. But also, scientifically speaking, you need five good interactions for every bad one. That's another way for you to know if you have a good um, relationship or friendship. So you have to have five good interactions. So if you're suddenly feeling this person's using you or they're doing this, that means your boundaries, you didn't, you didn't discuss your boundaries, you're unaware of where you guys stand and that's not good. So yeah, five good interactions for every bad one. So you're, you're giving people six strikes? Um, <laughs> no, it has to be five good ones. So if they suddenly two bad ones, that's a red flag. So if, if you have one interaction goes pretty well second interaction not so well interaction i mean even the text like every time you communicate to whatever got it that person makes you feel good but if suddenly it's like every time someone suddenly hitting you up and you feel like oh god i'm getting a text from this person or like oh god i don't want to see right this well no one wants that feeling and i think simone doesn't want that feeling either you have um, but comment, Johnny? like i don't even know who i am like i don't like it's like she's like how do you really know when you know someone like girl i don't even know who i am as a person i'm still <laughs> figuring it out so i don't really know if i really yeah know i don't think there's people. a scientific answer to it i think trusting your gut definitely yeah starting to understand that we need to be more curious about others will open the door to getting to know each other more. I think a lot of us are thinking about that meme we liked, we're in our head, we're focused on ourselves, we're not paying attention, listening and engaged in conversation with the other person. So it's tough to get to know someone. Find something, if you have something in common with that person, usually like a mutual hobby or something you like. And also research found, which is, I don't like this, this fact, but research found that usually nothing but one thing that brings people together is a mutual disgust mm -hmm. or hate for someone or something oh, else. Oh, yeah. There's that dating app all about what you hate. Well, there, that and, and any time that you're trying to rally the troops, so to speak, you want to find something that everyone, that, that is common that those common that enemy. Group people fears. Yeah, but I don't really like gossip. So usually if someone comes to me about someone they hate, like I'm the most annoying person because I'm like, do you hate them or do you hate something inside yourself? Let's talk about that. And then they're like, I hate you. Like, I'm leaving. <laughs> Never gossiping with you. For me, the way I've always seen it is you might be able to, to link up and find some commonalities and things that you don't like together, but you want to parlay that into two positive things. Right. Then you're just meeting up and just talking badly about that one person. That's, That's not going to help anything. I think in, in general, when people start talking openly about their own insecurities, mm -hmm. you start to feel like walls come down. They're getting more oh. comfortable with you. You're getting to know someone. I think so many of us, and we laughed about this earlier with the social media generation. We're all looking at everyone's highlight reel. We're all feeling the insecurities. Your account blew up because you're vocalizing the insecurities and right. everyone's feeling these insecurities. But a lot of us, we go on social media and, and we feel like we're the only ones with these insecurities and feeling down on ourselves. So when I'm around someone who admits about a business struggle or admits a personal issue that they're dealing with or maybe their relationship, they're having an issue. I'm like, OK, this person's trying to build a stronger relationship with me. They're getting vulnerable. They're being honest with me. The one thing I wanted to add there, too, is we would all like to think we know somebody before jumping into a relationship with somebody. However, part of that is the the vulnerability and risk that you're putting up and getting with that person, which should be even equal on for both parties to get into that relationship. You're supposed to both be wagering something uh, vulnerability wise. And of course, the first few times you hang out with anyone, you're not going to truly know them. Everyone's guard is up. Everyone is trying to put off a great first impression and make people like them. But as they start <laughs> to be more honest, be more vulnerable, you start to feel like you know someone deeper. Yeah, well, I think that's really true. I feel like I've, I've like, I'll, I make friends pretty easily, to be honest. And then I'll hang out with them, usually when it's one on one. And right after that one time, I know if I'm going to be friends with them or not. Yeah. I like to think we're all just uh, sharing marketing materials now like here's my social media check it out let me know what you think oh, here's my brand yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> that's funny yeah check out my socials let me know what you think and then call yeah, me give me a ring all right next question <laughs> here is from tamara she asks i'm a woman in my 20s i used to be pretty shy but i've gotten out of my shell since college i've been studying and practicing confidence and charisma for a while 
but still I find myself being timid in conversation when talking to dominant or demeaning personalities. For example, bosses, as well as really confident and attractive men. It's hard to talk loud enough and speak with conviction. Any advice? Well, are you trying to, are you yelling enough? Make sure to do that. <laughs> I'm kidding. Start shouting at them. <laughs> that works. Um, well, it's funny. Uh, she seems adorable, but like it's, again, it's something that some people are just more, have more of a charisma and are more charming and they're just born with it. And, or like you can learn it, but like you have to practice it. So it seems like she's like been studying it. And then she's like, why isn't it working? Cause it's not a test. It's real life. Mm -hmm. Like you have to actually feel confident to be confident. You can't just read about how to be confident. So I think she is still in the process to get there. But, um, when it comes with a attractive men are the most insecure. That's like, that's one thing she has to remember. They don't know how to talk to women because they never had to talk to women their whole life. Women come to them. And so it's like, she just. Has to, she needs to let that go because they're just as insecure and if she just compliments their eyes or something they'll fall in love with her okay. probably <laughs> <laughs> and then when it comes with demeaning people those people just suck in general so there's no real practice to deal with those people I think I've learned over the years that there's nothing my dad told me before like you can't teach a pig new tricks mm -hmm. or like a pig to be something else or whatever I forgot what he said but it's, so it's like don't argue with that person. I think I've learned now that when someone's demeaning to me, I know in my heart that has nothing to do with me. It has to do with them because they feel small. And you just have to be quiet and try to avoid that person. Yeah, and the, the, the flip side is, why are you trying to win over someone who's demeaning, right? So Because it, she probably has daddy issues or something. <laughs> so she needs to check out the account. But I understand. Like Sometimes you just really want certain people to like you. And I've had that before when someone's kind of demeaning and I just want them to think I'm smart or whatever. And eventually I'm like, you know what? Who cares? It's not worth it. And when it comes to bosses, that part, like my sister, who's she's so... She's like a fire sign and she is so like forward. And yet with her bosses, she's always been fearful to, to tell them how she feels about certain things. And one of my partners taught me before that stuck with me. He said that um, if you want something, you'll never get it unless you ask. And that always stuck with me. And it's really true. Like when I even like, for example, if you want a promotion or you want a raise, most likely because we're so in our heads, we think like, Oh, I must not be doing a good job. That's why I haven't got a raise. No, it's because they're just not thinking about you at all. Because right. they're just You're focused on the their radar. things. You have to get on the radar. And even if it's embarrassing, even if you hate it, you have to hold in those insecurities. You have to approach that person. Say what you think. If you feel uncomfortable to be verbal, email your boss to tell him what you want. And then it opens a conversation. Like I've had that with my partner in my public accounting firm where I wanted a raise. I didn't get it that day. Or I think a promotion. I didn't get it that day. But now he knew, oh, I didn't know you were interested in that. Okay, let's let's have a conversation. Let's figure out like how you can get there. One of the things we talk a lot about on the show, and it's a little difficult to demonstrate on audio, is just changing your body language and your positioning with someone who's dominant, who's demeaning, who's aggressive. So it's the difference between us directly facing each other versus us standing next to each other side by side. So if you're in a situation like we are here in studio, being on the same side of the table as someone is gonna alleviate that dominant pressure and that aggression. Moving next to that person shoulder to shoulder so you're both facing the same direction is gonna remove that tension that you're feeling. Because what she's saying is, I'm feeling timid in conversation around these certain types of people and I would say, pay attention to your body language. What are you doing? Are you closing your arms? Are you right. making yourself smaller? position yourself to be next to them, which we call neutral body language, and you'll feel a lot of that tension leave your body, and all of a sudden you're gonna find that confidence that you have in all these other areas. And the, be A, I 100% agree with you, and I've read before about body languages, like even if you're leaning forward and you're more interested and yeah. things like that. The last thing that I, I think I forgot to mention is that if you want people to like you or you feel uncomfortable and you want to ease the pressure, um, talk about them. The person that's demeaning you wants to hear about themselves because he thinks he's so smart. Your boss thinks he's wonderful and he's an amazing boss. Let him know how great he is. But don't give like fake, um, you know, uh, co compliments, right. but kind of just. It's counterintuitive, but you can really disarm someone who's being aggressive or demeaning by giving them a genuine compliment. Like, yeah, I like how uh, amazing you were in helping me with this project. And all of a sudden that person who's demeaning to everyone else is gonna actually be a little nicer to exactly. you. Exactly, like you are, like honestly, I envy how your leadership skills. Like it's so crazy how like good you are at this. And then they'll be like, oh, 
Thank you for noticing that because I've been <laughs> putting everyone else down because they really just can't tell. Never noticed it. <laughs> Last question here. Ian has a question about seeking approval. I largely have become the confident centered, attractive person I want to be after years of working on myself, but I still fall into approval seeking and supplicative mode in the presence of authority figures or people that I subconsciously deem as high status. How do I manage and minimize this? Wow. Well, that's going to be like years of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's not, it's not, that's like a solution from within. And I can completely relate to that where I was like, um, I was born with enamel deficiency, which means because I was born in a third world country. And it means that all my teeth were incredibly yellow, not just yellow. They're just, I don't have enamel. So they couldn't protect my teeth. So every tooth I had a cavity in and like I have like oh, no. 15 root canals and all my teeth are veneers. That's why they look so good. But I remember when I quote unquote came out, I said, um, OK, once my teeth are perfect, I'm going to get my whole mouth done, which is I don't know if you know how much veneers are. It's very expensive. It's daddy issues it's, money. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was actually because my parents paid for my, my teeth were medical issues. So my parents my whole life paid for them. So it was like lumineers, veneers, um, capsules. It was bondings, everything. But through insurance, you never get the Hollywood veneers. You Insurance doesn't pay for that. Hollywood veneers are $1,800 a tooth. So through daddy issues money, I saved up. And my parents was like, listen, mom and dad, I don't want you to pay for this anymore. Like, I will pay for this. And it was just different because any type of veneers that I would get, um, my real yellow teeth would reflect forward. So no matter how white the, you would put over my teeth, my teeth would still look yellow. They won't look as bad as my real teeth underneath. But my teeth never looked good. And I always was insecure about dating and all that. So anyway, so I was like, once I get these perfect teeth, now I will be beautiful. And I got these perfect teeth and I finally felt beautiful for a month. <laughs> and then I was like, so, and I remember I was just like, oh my God, I'm beautiful. When I smiled for the first time, it was like the most be amazing thing in the world. And then a month later, a month, uh, two months later, suddenly I look at another girl and I'm like, well, she has this. And why do I look like that? And suddenly I start to get insecure again. And I think, and I start to feel down about myself. And suddenly I was like, what else do I need to fix about myself? We're like, why am I sad? Like, I don't understand. I always thought once I fix this, I will be mm. good enough. And now I don't feel good enough. And eventually I realized it never had anything to do with my teeth, to be honest. It had to do with like how you feel inside or why it is that you thought you were never good enough because you had this one flaw. And I think that's the same thing with this person. He fixed what's on the outside, but he never fixed what's on the right. inside, which and for me, it took me like a full year to be like, I like this about myself. And obviously there's still times because I, I do what I do. So, of course, I'm constantly comparing myself to people. There's still times where I look at other girls and I feel jealous. But then I have to be like, but they're not me. That I always will remember that I am an individual. They will never be me. And I have to love myself for who I am before someone else can love me. It's certainly comparing yourself to yourself rather than other people is certainly going to help. I think for all of us, no matter how much work we put in to ourselves and to, to to develop ourselves and to get better there's always going to be those moments that come out of nowhere that shock us where we're not so tough or confident as we thought we were and it's that that moment makes us see what can be there underneath and it's scary however it is for that journey of continuing to get better every day that allows those moments to be farther and farther in between and we talk about journaling i mean looking at those moments that you're feeling this way and and looking at the environment and the triggers that may be causing it and if you see the same thing in patterns over and over again therapy is a great way to work through this that doesn't mean you are weak in some way it just means you've identified an area that you want to improve in and i think when we're when it comes to the presence of authority figures or people that we subconsciously deem as high status Obviously, we have daddy issues here. It comes to a lot of how we were raised in the beginning. And those patterns are imprinted in us in childhood. And you could be confident in other areas and still have a lack of confidence in this area until you tackle the deeper issue. You know what's so crazy? Like all the, um, all a lot of the answers are, were uh, the questions and the answers we're giving in my brain. Like I'm, um, like I feel like I'm giving myself advice because there's also in my life someone that I Absolutely. feel intimidated by for some reason, and I'm really confident. And then in my head, I'm like, yeah, remove him from his pedestal. <laughs> you know, he's just like you. Don't be timid around him. Well, then, thank you for joining us for these fun questions. What is up for you in 2020? I know you're getting Instagram videos removed and put back up, hopefully. What else um, are you working on? Porn, for sure. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my sense of humor, so daddy issues. Um, 
Um, this year, well, there's my Too Tired to Be Crazy podcast that's on every Thursday. Um, I want to create more funny content on my personal Instagram, Violet Benson, where it's just um, fun videos for women or men, just empowering. I'm really, 2020 is more about me trying to empower and re reteach everyone how to love themselves again because I think social media kind of ruined it for a lot of people. Sure. Um, I'm also getting into, I will be releasing one or two books this year. Awesome. One will be a poem book that I've been working on. The next one is a dating advice book. And the last one is a funny sex uh, book that's a coffee table book. That's the porn. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm not in it. <laughs> but it's like just funny sex. It's really hilarious. So there's the books. And then um, um, I'll be getting back on YouTube. And we'll see. I mean, I think I'm, I'm working on some stuff that has to do with TV that I can't talk about. All right. Going All right. to parties alone. Going to parties alone will always be my thing. Oh, and I'm going to find love this year. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah. But I feel alive